was really a very uh, inspiring uh, series of talks and you know, very thought-provoking. Um, so I think we'd like to just use this as a chat. You know, it doesn't, uh, not uh, bilateral, could be multilateral, and also including the audience as well. So maybe I'll start with uh, Greg. Um, you spent a lot of time in the LMB, and, and of course reading from LMB, I know that for the last several decades, it has, what, 14 or 15 Nobel Prizes? Yeah, lost count, right? <laughs> uh, could you help make sure that Pro Professor uh, Greg Winder's uh, microphone is working? Okay, it works. Sorry, yes. Yeah, I don't know the number. Yeah. I, I read somewhere, I think probably 14 or 15 Nobel Prizes, and in some years, even two Nobel Prizes. Um, so what do you think is the uh, factor of success that somehow contributed to this you know, power of innovation in one laboratory? Yeah, I, I guess I, I wish we knew. Um, I've been there my entire scientific career, and there have been lots of speculations as to what it is. Um, one of the arguments it was that it was the lab canteen because people spent their time in the canteen talking and discussing things. I, I was always skeptical because I rarely went to the lab canteen. And, um, but those people who did go to the lab canteen a lot, like Sidney Brenner, believed it was important. I, I actually um, think probably the most important um, is, the, is, the, is the continuous culture of going for uh, uh, only the most important problems and being able to really uh, uh, take a long-term view on them. Um, I, uh, you know, I remember many years ago I, when I was a student, um, I, I, I got asked by my supervisor who also worked at the Laboratory of Molecular Biology and was one of the first people there, Brian, Brian Hartley. Um, he asked us to do a, a, a kind of review of of um, papers. He gave us some papers to we could decide, got a good little presentation in front of other students. And, uh, and we, we could choose what we wanted. And I chose this thing, which I thought was quite interesting. And he said to me, he listened in stony silence. He said, well, why did you choose that? And I said, because it was interesting. He said, interesting be buggered, he said. He said, is it important? And I said, well, I, I, I'm probably not. He said, next one went on to the next one. And I learned an important lesson there that, that you, you need to focus on important problems. He said there's many things in life that are interesting. Science is full of interesting things, but focus on the important problem and put a stake through its heart, was his view. So do it properly, but don't be frightened by the problem. Important problems are going to often be very complicated. You know, have that big vision, but make sure it's important that you're wasting your life, you're spending your life on. Thank you. I think the young you know, scientists here will, you should take that to heart. Okay. Now, and then, um, just now in the introduction, we, we have seen, for example, that each of our free speakers have really made tremendous success in the you know, commercialization of their inventions and of the work. So next, I'd like to maybe ask uh, each of them to share with us, you know, what are some of the you know, difficulties or, or lessons that they've learned from this journey. So maybe we'll start with uh, Shanka. <clears throat> well, my, my, my first example of commercializing uh, anything was uh, Selexa. And um, I, I should say, uh, we, we, uh, I never really considered myself an entrepreneur and never wasn't really looking to uh, set up a company. But in, in 1997, if you, um, we actually wrote a research grant to develop the work and take it further. And I said to David Klenerman, my colleague, I think this project might require more than the efforts of one or two people to reduce to practice. And uh, the only way we could mobilize sufficient resource to take on the project was to set up a company. It was a virtual company because it's still 
took place in our labs for a while. Um, so it was a mechanism to, um, to drive the project forwards. Now, um, I guess what I've learned since then is for, for a certain type of scientific problem or technology problem, if, if it reaches a certain stage of evolution where it, it needs a, a kind of engineering mindset and scale, um, setting up a, a company can actually be a very good way of moving it forward towards its goal. And, and I think certain types of problems, um, discovery, opening up new areas, um, you can't do in a company, they're best done in academia because they require time, creativity, and so on. Um, other types of problems, I think, uh, can be very well suited to the environment and focus um, in, in a biotech. So um, I was just thinking of your, your original question, what was my experience of doing? I had no business experience. I had not raised money from uh, an investor before at that stage. And I approached it very much in the spirit of, if you write a research grant, um, you have to identify a problem. Uh, Greg's um, pointed out the, the value in expressing why a problem or an opportunity is important. I think seeing that it's important and expressing that. Um, and then you have to persuade someone to, uh, to back it. It's not that dissimilar to what we do with research grants in academia, actually? We, we had a chat last night about the intellectual property policies of different universities. So I understand uh, from, from your discussion that um, Cambridge is really very liberal, right? So the, the IP is sort of controlled or, or rested in the PIs. So do you think that has contributed to the success of Cambridge in this area? Well, uh, so the, the policy in Cambridge University is that um, the, the control of the intellectual property rests largely with the inventors. So it can be a PI, it can be a student, it can be a postdoc. Um, now, you have to involve the university and its tech transfer office um, in taking it forward, but actually um, the, the IP is not taken away from the inventors. Now, uh, it's more common in universities for IP to be taken away from inventors, either to the funding body or the um, tech transfer people, who then seize control of it, and in, in, in some cases they, uh, they can neglect the, the vision or wishes of the inventors. So these are two, two opposite strategies. I, I, I favor the approach we've had so far in Cambridge. I don't know if it'll stay that way. Um, because oft, often the, um, the inventors actually have the vision for how the IP may be developed into something that may take a bit of time. Um, and I think if it's taken away from them, you lose that spirit um, and vision. Thank you. Now, Tech, just now you talk about your tremendous success with Agios and now with the promise held by Treadwell. But in your journey of commercialization, has it always been smooth sailing or have you encountered some challenges over the time? Uh, thank you. I, I, like many of you, I, I was a stubborn academic, and, and I frowned upon the dark side until my daughter went to college at Stanford, and she brought home uh, her fee. Uh, <laughs> and I looked at the fee, and I said, is this for four years? She said, no, this is for one year. I said, but that's... <laughs> I don't even make that much as a, you know, professor at the University of Toronto. So uh, I, I joined the dark side. I went to join Amgen, be the vice president. There I 
I played a lot of golf, but I also learned that there was a very serious side. Some of you know that Amgen, when it, the beginning of Amgen, I don't think there is any equal even up to today, maybe with Moderna. Um, but uh, that gave me the, the, the kind of wish and desire that I could make it happen that an idea can actually get all the way to the clinic. And that kind of satisfaction to convert a, a, a you know, an idea into the clinic um, is, is so very special. And of course, um, when I left that gen, um, I, I couldn't stop. And uh, so, you know, it, I kept going and things looking good so far. That's great, thank you. And Greg, has the commercialization of all those antibody technologies been very smooth sailing, or did you see any difficulties? Well, well for me, it was not smooth sailing, it was very hard. Um, uh, so in the very beginning on the humanized antibodies, which actually probably had a bigger commercial impact than the human antibodies, um, that was the most stressful time of my life because I was in, um, so I was in Cambridge, I was employed by the Medical Research Council and they took the view they owned everything and they wanted to hand over that patent to a UK biotech company called Celtech. Um, it was really a kind of like a private wish of the head of the, of, of the Medical Research Council, Sir James Gowans, to do that. And um, I actually didn't agree with it, uh, that policy, because I felt that there were many mouse antibodies out there which could be ready to go into the clinic uh, if they were humanized. And I didn't see why you should tie it up in the hands of one company. I thought it should be broadly exploited, rather like Stanford uh, exploited the recombinant DNA pattern, where you take a, some, some small royalty and you upfront payment and people can get on with it. So there was a hell of an argument about it. Um, and it, uh, I don't want to go into the details, but it culminated in me um, nearly being fired um, uh, um, because uh, I was told it, my, my invention was owned by the Medical Research Council and I had no place to argue. They made the decisions. Um, and uh, I, I was so frustrated, I wrote to the chief operating officer of uh, Celtec and said, okay, you've won, but... Um, as the inventor, I shall make sure that you just left, you get left with a smoking ruin. I'm willing to destroy my own patent in, when it comes to litigation. So, so um, you know, tell that to your investors. And um, it actually, so then Sir James Gowans um, wanted to fire me, but fortunately, um, Cesar Milstein and Aaron Cloak stepped in and said, well, yeah, he shouldn't have done that, really. And if he'd asked us, um, we would have told him not to do it. But, um, but now the situation being what it is um, uh, actually has a point about the, the whole business. But in fact, I, I was just so stressed. Um, and it took a very long time. Even Sir Aaron Klug was, had a lot of arguments getting it through the system. So for us, that was very frustrating. But that's turned out to be the reason that those antibodies got used because they weren't locked up in an in a opaque patenting strategy and many other companies were able to pick it up and run. And in fact, in the end, the Medical Research Council made about $500 million or more from those patents. And it would have made even more if they'd been more intelligent about some of the ways they exploited the patent. But it's a problem because, because in many cases, the decisions higher up are not necessarily taken by, by people who, who know the field um, or, or, or even willing to put their arguments. So th that, that was one example. So sometimes you know, it, we lucked out in the end, but um, I think we were very lucky. And I was lucky to be in a job because um, uh, you know, they had wanted to get rid of me. Well, it's lucky for them as well. Otherwise, <laughs> when you get a Nobel Prize, the affiliation bit would be very difficult, all right. 
Now, anyway, now, so the time is almost up, actually. Let's take just one question from the audience, if there's one. Anybody? Yes, please. So could we uh, pass this gentleman a uh, microphone? Um, thank you very much uh, to Professor uh, Winter. Um, a very great research. As you mentioned earlier, uh, the immune therapy has a double edge in the treatment of tumors and may promote uh, the tumor progress, progression. Uh, I was curious, to, do these antibody mimics also exhibit uh, the undesirable property? And if the answer is yes, how can we solve this problem? Thank you very much. So, I, I wasn't completely sure I understood that, but it seemed to be. Do the antibody mimics, were you saying, are they immunogenic? Are, are, are they... Undesirable properties, right? Is that uh, what you do, mean? Yes. Undesirable properties yeah, of, antibody. Of, of being immunogenic. Is that, uh, Is that the property you were thinking about? Or? Uh, I'm curious, uh, 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 this uh, 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 antibody mimics uh, uh, may uh, promote the tumor progress. Since you mentioned earlier, the immune uh, therapy uh, has a double edge that, that uh, may uh, promote the tumor progression. Um, I don't think I said uh, immunotherapy can promote tumor progression. I mean, it might be able to do in some situations. Maybe that was TAC. But, 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 uh, but, but actually, um, immunotherapy, uh, in the case of antibodies, uh, I think what I did say was you have an, um, a, a, in the stem, there are a number of killing activities, some of which uh, may not be desirable to have operating together in the same thing. Each, each one of them may individually be useful. But when you have them t getting together, they can interfere with each other. Now, obviously, we wouldn't have that in these antibody mimics because we can only really, we can only really tune in one function at a time. They're too small to incorporate multiple functions in the same section, if, if that's what you were talking about. Yes, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. So uh, since the time is up, so let's uh, wrap up this session now and thank our free speaker for very inspirational talks and discussion. Thank you.